Good morning, everybody. We always like to start on time, and so I really want the lecture to start at 10 because everybody's on a schedule. But I always talk longer than I should, and I'm going to pre-apologize for that, but I'm going to still do it. Um, and so I thought I'd start early and make it happen that we get started at 10. My name is Bergie Miller. I am the executive director of the Ding Darling Wildlife Society, which is the nonprofit arm of the National Wildlife Refuge, JN Ding Darling. And uh, we have now going into our 40th year uh, supporting the refuge where federal funding falls short. We're going to show a little video um, about who we are, but before I do, who here loves the bald eagle? Uh, yeah, we all love the bald eagle, and a huge thanks to the Southwest Florida Eagle Cam, and I'll say a little, few more words about them um, after I show the, the introduction video of who we are, but uh, it's an amazing bird, it's an amazing species, and we're very lucky to have them as a sponsor, to have their Eagle Cam out there for millions of people to enjoy and learn from. And then we have a speaker today who will be amazing as well for his book on the bald eagle that will be in print. It's now at the publishers and will be ready in a year. So I'm going to have April show a quick little video about who we are, and then I'm going to come back, say a few more words, and then introduce our speaker, Jack Davis. generation. 
I wanted to be at the refuge because there were things that I could do here. Every time I come to volunteer, I see the important work of, of that's being done by the Dean Darling Wildlife Society. I see the smile on children's faces and families who are enjoying nature and wildlife. It is so wonderful, it really is, to know that all of this work will be protected for the next generation because of the work that the society has accomplished. Because if we don't do it, who will? Who will do it? To that end, the Dean Darling Wildlife Society is dedicated to ensuring that Dean's legacy lives on at the JN Dean Darling National Wildlife Refuge. We invite you to join us and our thousands of members in supporting the refuge for generations to come. is who we are and uh, thank you to everybody here for caring and loving the wildlife that surround us um, everywhere and it does take everybody it takes everybody to work together from the the family of the Southwest Florida Eagle Can and doing what they're doing to spread the, the message and educating people to the authors uh, writing books to get people to become inspired to, to learn and make a difference to the artists we have some hand carved uh, eagles, bald eagles out front by an artist, Jim Sprankle. If you've been to our center, we have many of his carvings inside the center, which are, again, a different way to inspire people and photographers and all sorts of people. So thank you to everybody here for caring and uh, making a difference. If you're not a member, we'd love to have you join. You can also sign up for our e-newsletter, which is Ding on the Wing. I think many of you do receive that already, but it's a great way to just keep on top of what's happening at the refuge, and I know we get so overwhelmed with emails, especially now since COVID, um, just click delete if you're busy, and that might be every week, but then there might be a time where you're taking some time to take a breath and, and get out, and then you can read it that week. So that's the ding on the wing that you can sign up for in the back. The other thing that we just launched, uh, how many here love the game Jeopardy? I love watching it. I'm not very good at playing it. Um, but it's always fun to be a part of it. And Alex Trebek was a big part of our lives for many, many years for those who did watch it. We, with the society, have to do everything differently, just like these lectures with COVID, just like every other group and organization out there. So where we normally had an on-site fundraiser here called Go Wild for Ding, we raised several hundred thousand dollars with an auction and a dinner. We have to do things virtually now. And so ours is going to be Go Wild for Jeopard Ding, right? How clever is that? Um, we are going to tape it professionally at a video studio where our Alex Trebek is Rachel Pierce, who is a TV personality here locally and is now our artist in residence. And then we have a number of contestants who will be playing for fake dollars, but um, all to support the refuge. And then we will debut it to ticketed people. It's $50 a person, and I know that seems like a lot for a virtual event. Um, but it does support the refuge and you have some fun. And if you live here, you can actually add a dinner to it that you pick up that will be warm and delicious and you watch it in front of your TV and uh, watch the show. So if you are interested in that, that's going to be our big fundraiser. And we'd love to have thousands of people watching virtually from around the world um, our Jeopardy show. And it should be a ton of fun. So a lot of fun for that. But in 2012, I think they've been around for many, many years, the Southwest Florida Eagle Cam was the first camera to capture 360 degree look into the, the nest. So if you got onto the thing, you saw a little bit of, of it up there, it, it's amazing. And I encourage all of you to look at that. They have 1.6 million people, maybe more, um, over its life that people have watched it. There are people truly who feel like they're their parents of the babies. Um, and we all watched with fascination when the, the babies were brought to Crow recently. And it takes teamwork of different organizations and people uh, to help keep everything healthy and viable. And uh, it's been fun to watch them, so I encourage you to, to look at that. And thank you to the Southwest Florida Eagle Cam family, Pritchett family, for being a part of this lecture. We really appreciate it. Jack Davis is here, and he is an author and professor of history at the University of Florida. He is one of our most popular speakers when he comes. He's been several times here for our lecture series. He earned a BA and an MA from the University of South Florida and a PhD from Brandeis University. I hope I said that right. 
Before joining the University of Florida faculty, he taught at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where he was Director of Environmental Studies, and he currently teaches Environmental History and Sustainability Studies. In 2018, Davis received the Pulitzer Prize for the history for his book, The Gulf, History of the Gulf, The Making of the, an American Sea. We have some of those out front. In addition to the prize, he has racked up a number of other honors for his books and teaching stints at schools from the University of Birmingham to the University of Jordan. He has written for the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Tampa Bay Times, The Orient, and other publications. Following his Pulitzer winning book about the Gulf of Mexico, Jack focused on bald eagles in a historical context. His newest book, Bird of Paradox, How the Bald Eagle Saved the Soul of America, is a natural and cultural history of the bald eagle from pre-European settlement to the present. It will look at the historical relationship between Americans and the bald eagle as a national symbol and a natural species. And I am sure this book will be up for a Pulitzer Prize as well. It will be printed and in stores in March next year, but we get to hear from the mouth first um, today from Jack Davis. So Jack, please join me, and please join me in welcoming Jack. Also, such a great pleasure to see the, the love for the bald eagle, not just in this room, but around Sanibel and some, some folks uh, I've, I've talked to since I've been down just yesterday. And uh, that's, that's always heartwarming. And uh, I, the, the, the bald eagle, uh, I grew up in Florida, and those of you who are from Florida know this, that in the 70s, early 80s, 60s, you didn't see any bald eagle. Uh, or if you did, you saw a very rare sight. I grew up in the Tampa Bay area. I never saw a bald eagle there because the bay was almost dead. Uh, and I write about this in, in the Gulf of Mexico book. And by the way, I should say, if when you buy, when you purchase a copy of the Gulf or this new book that just happened to come out instead of the eagle book, this happened to just come out. My latest book, come out, the Wild Heart of Florida, Wilder Heart of Florida. Uh, came out just as a matter of fact you have advanced copies. It's not officially released, but we have copies here When you buy copies of these books, you're supporting the, the society and um, The books are signed. This book is a collection of personal essays of Florida nature um, writers from around the state um, and Most of them still alive a few of them uh, such as Mark Stoneman Douglas and Harriet Beecher Stowe Believe it or not lived in Florida uh, and wrote um, a lot about the Florida environment uh, in the 19th century. And uh, so these are fun uh, essays about Florida. They're a celebration of, of natural Florida. And uh, as is the, the Gulf of Mexico book, Celebration of the Gulf of Mexico, in the, the Bald Eagle book I'm writing now is very much a, a celebration. And you're, you're going to um, hear a lot about it today. I hope not too much. I don't want to give away too much because next year, when the book comes out in March, I want you to buy a copy and, and of course support the society then. But let me start with the Bald Eagle book. Actually, the Gulf book led me to writing about the Bald Eagle because met the memory of not seeing them growing up, but knowing that they had made this tremendous comeback uh, and knowing what role they play uh, in, in the environment, just really inspired me to write about this, uh, this marvelous bird. Uh, and uh, a, bi a, 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 actually a, if you will, a biography of the bald eagle hasn't been written in over 20 years. So I saw a need there to, to write this book. And there's no book that's quite like this one. It's a substantial book. It's about the size of the Gulf of Mexico book. But it's also a book that is written for a intellectually curious audience like yourself. It's not an academic book. I don't write ac academic books. You do that, and they sit on the cold steel shelf in the library, and nobody checks them out. Uh, and so uh, this book, I, but, and I chose to write about the eagle, bald eagle, not only because it, I felt it was a book that needed to be written, but I wanted to write another environmental book like I did with the Gulf of Mexico about something that everybody can appreciate. 
no matter wh where you are on the political spectrum, who doesn't love the bald eagle? Uh, everybody loves the bald eagle, right? Whether, uh, whether you love it because for patriotic reasons or because you're uh, a birder and you love nature or for both. Um, and that's what's really spectacular about the bald eagle. But it wasn't always that way, which I'll talk about um, um, uh, to, uh, this morning. This, by the way, is one of my favorite bald eagles. This is Sarge. She lives up the road in Largo, Florida, where I grew up. Uh, and she is in, at a raptor center there. She's flightless. And she has come to uh, two of my Gulf of Mexico talks as something of, uh, of, a, of a mascot. And uh, she, she's a wonderful bird. But I want to start, oh, it's in my pocket. I want to start by, with a quiz. And my students at UF go, oh, please, no. All right, what is a national bird? What did Ben Franklin want as? He wanted the turkey. Does anybody disagree with those answers? Yeah. Somebody said, yeah. Yeah, you're wrong on both counts. We have no national bird. We have a national mammal, which is the bison. We have a national flower, the rose. We have a national tree, which is the oak. We have no national, officially, we have no national bird. President Biden could appoint the mockingbird, the crow, um, uh, or some other bird as a national bird tomorrow. Uh, uh, but we're fortunate. The federal government has no historical memory. So the federal government doesn't even know this. Um, you can look at, uh, feder at federal agency websites and they will describe the bald eagle as a national bird. It's not. Um, and it's a, it's a national symbol, clearly. Uh, and I'll talk about how, in a minute, about how it became a national symbol, which you know. As far as Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin never said he wanted the turkey as a national bird. That's the myth. Uh, now, he did compare the, 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 the morality. Uh, of, the, of the turkey with the bald eagle in a letter to his daughter, Sarah Bach. And, uh, but he never once said, I want the turkey as the national bird uh, or on the great seal of the United States. He wanted something else. He was on the first committee appointed on July 4th, 1776, right after Congress, the Continental Congress, approved the Declaration of Independence. Uh, they, they said, okay, now we need a national seal. We've got to put our stamp on our documents and our, uh, on our treaties. And, and of course, particularly the, the peace treaty with, with Great Britain when we, we, we finished whipping their butts. Um, and they didn't have one. So they appointed this stellar committee, or you would assume a stellar committee, or a committee of stellar personnel. Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. Who better? Those guys failed miserably in coming up with a national system. It took Congress six years, almost as long as it took uh, the U.S. Uh, to, to, um, to defeat the British. It took Congress six years to come up with a proper seal. Three committees, 14 um, men uh, in all involved before they came up with the bald eagle. And this is a drawing of the, or a rendition of the first um, conception of the bald eagle for the great seal of the United States. Uh, and it was, um, it, it's, it's not very impressive, but it's, it's, it's a start, it's pretty close. Uh, the wings are facing in the opposite direction. Um, this, this eagle has a crest, and bald eagles do not have crests. And um, it has chicken legs. <laughs> and um, it does have an olive branch, but it looks like it's in a pot. <laughs> and, um, but this was just a draft, okay? Uh, by, uh, that was rendered by Charles Thompson, who was the secretary of the Continental Congress. And he's the one who came up with the idea to put the bald eagle on, on the great seal of the United States. And this is the, what it, the first dive looked like, okay? And this lasted through uh, the, the 19th century. It was revised slightly in 1840, and then 
uh, and then again in the 1880s. But up until the 1880s, it looked pretty much like this. And, um, um, and then in the 1880s, uh, a Tiffany's jeweler actually revised the, uh, the design of the bald eagle, removed what somewhat looks like the crest, uh, and gave us the, um, the image that we have today. Um, and so the, this is what Ben Franklin wanted. You know what that is? He wanted Moses on the great seal of the United States. Here this Deus, right? Uh, this this um, red, white, and blue American. Uh, he and the others are constantly looking back to uh, European influences uh, for their great seal of the United States. But he wants Moses, and this is actually Moses closing their sea on Pharaoh. And, and of course, the inscription says, what does it say? Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Um, this was tabled immediately by the Continental Congress. Um, and this I just want to show you. This is John Trumbull. Some of you may be familiar with this. This is John Trumbull's um, very famous 1818 uh, painting, uh, Declaration of Independence. Now, when he painted this, um, which he started in 1817, uh, when he was painting this, uh, the bald eagle was a popular symbol, very, very popular symbol in the U.S. But during, and this is, this is the Congress presenting uh, the declaration to John Hancock. Uh, and this gentleman, and I don't know if this thing has a laser or not, and if I push the wrong button, we'll be in trouble. Uh, this, this is Charles Thompson uh, right here, the one who came up with the, with, with the with bald eagle. And I started looking at this, um, you know, and... Obviously, John Trumbull would not have included, should not have included the bald eagle anywhere in this in this painting because it would have been anachronistic in 1776. It wasn't a popular icon uh, at that point. But there is an eagle in there. Where is it? In the back? The battle, the battle flags. Look at that. It's it's a lousy picture. Sorry. I haven't, this is the first time I've, I've used this group of pictures, and the resolution isn't very good on this. So some of them, unfortunately, I think will be, will be blurry. Uh, but I looked at that, and I said, oh my gosh, there's an eagle right there. And he was inspired by Thomas Jefferson in conversation with Jefferson in Paris over glasses of wine um, to, um, uh, to paint this scene. So let me talk a little bit about, and you're, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, uh, the, um, the biology of the bald eagle and the, the life of the bald eagle. Now, this is the most, it's a really impressive looking bird, isn't it? It's the only bird in North America that has dark body and wing feathering and white, and white tail feathers and white head feathers uh, and when it's mature. And uh, this is called the superorbital ridge, which is very prominent. We, our, our, our own eye goes right to that ridge, right, all the time. And it's ideal for a national symbol to be on the Great Seal of the United States, because what does that look tell you? It's a don't tread on me stare, isn't it? And it really is a, a spectacular bird. It's, Bald eagles, there are over 60 eagle species worldwide. Bald eagles are truly an American bird because they live nowhere else outside of North America. Uh, they're an endemic species. There's one other eagle, of course, that lives in North America, uh, and that's the golden eagle. But the golden eagle ranges across the northern hemisphere. Um, so this is our bird. This is America's bird. Uh, and it's, uh, as you know, it's, it's a fast flying bird. It can travel up to uh, 35 miles an hour on its own. Of course, even better if it has a tailwind. It's a great soaring bird. Its uh, wingspan is uh, ideal for a hunting bird, for a fishing bird. It's, it's ideal for tight maneuverability. Uh, a longer wingspan uh, would be too much for the maneuverability that the, the bald eagle is capable of. But it also, that wingspan allows it to soar great distances. 
and, and I'll talk more about grace distances in, in just a minute. And uh, its eyesight, as many of you probably know, is four to eight times greater than human eyesight. Um, and, but like other birds, it sees in four dimensions. So the bald eagle, which is really spectacular, it can see a mile, more than a mile away a white rabbit in the white snow. Or it can see a gray squirrel in gray shaded uh, foliage or a tree. And it can see the rabbit over here and focus on the rabbit over here and the squirrel over here at the same time. And then it can say, hmm, what do I want today? <laughs> and, uh, and of course, and they're, and they're smart. Now they will, they're also among the few birds that will, that will take food from the air, land, and water. They are in the sea eagle genus, and uh, they prefer fish. Um, but they will eat other things. But they're also scavengers, um, of course. Uh, this here are pictures of the mature and immature bald eagles. Um, the one over here on um, the far side, the two there, that uh, juvenile is is probably still in his first year. Uh, they are chocolatey brown. Uh, they don't have their yellow yellow feet. This this guy's feet are starting to lighten up or, or beat yet, uh, and uh, that comes as 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 they mature. And when the juveniles leave their nest uh, after 12 weeks or so, um, they are as large and sometimes larger in weight than the parents because the parents do such a damn good job of feeding them. It's like us feeding our kids, you know, leaving the refrigerator door open for them all the time. Stop. Um, and the parents throughout the nesting period, even though uh, the juveniles can go out and scavenge, uh, they will continue to bring food to the nest. Uh, and their wings, their, their, um, their uh, wing feathers are actually slightly longer, the, the juveniles, than the, than the adults until uh, they molt those feathers. Uh, and this, of course, is the various stages uh, that they, they move through. Uh, and they, they find a partner uh, around four to five years, if they're lucky. Um, and here, just a few things, a blurry, blurry picture. Um, the, the, what's interesting about the bald, what distinguishes the bald eagle from the golden eagle is not only the white head and the white tail, because the juveniles look very much like the, uh, the mature golden eagle, and were often confused to their peril for being golden eagles and shot and killed by ranchers out west uh, who saw them as predators. Uh, but the difference is that the the bald, uh, the golden eagles, these are actually, this is actually the foot here. You know where the, what we call the backwards knee? Uh, that's not a knee, that's an ankle. Um, uh, on, on, on the stick-legged wading birds and all birds, uh, and so from that, what we consider the knee, or actually ankle down, is the foot, and then there are the toes. Well, the, the golden eagle's toes are booted. The feathers go all the way down to the toes, uh, or feet are completely booted. Um, the feathers go all the way down to the toes. The bald eagles are, are slightly in above the toes. Uh, that's because the e this golden eagle is not a fishing bird, but the bald eagle does, um, uh, or that's one reason. And um, so here is um, a, um, of course, a, a, a couple. Um, as you know, I'm sure bald eagles mate for life um, as long as each spouse is, is alive. Uh, if one dies, the other typically goes off and, and finds a, a replacement. And you all know, I think, the, the story of Ozzie and Harriet in M15 those incidences that happen too. I write about them in the evil book, by the way. Um, they are very devoted parents, as those of you who watch Eagle Cams know. And by the way, I should point out, Eagle Cams are the most popular wildlife cams in the world. More popular than panda, tigers, you know, big cats, uh, alligators. Um, they are the most popular. They weren't the first 
wildlife cams. They came early on in uh, 2006 when uh, Canada was, was launched, and, uh, but they are the, uh, the, the, the most popular. But the, the eagles are very devoted parents. Uh, they take very good care of little stories about it. Sometimes one of the young is dominant over the other one and, uh, and will even kill the other one, and the, and the parents allow that to happen. But otherwise, they are, uh, and who are we to judge what they're doing there? Um, but, uh, that, but, that, but they're very devoted parents. Uh, and of course, they come back to the same nest every year as long as, as long as that nest is there. If a storm has taken it down, or the power company, by mistake, has removed it, or a cell phone company has removed it from a cell tower by mistake, um, they will generally rebuild in the, in the area, and almost always immediately. Now, who's the best known ornithologist in the U.S. history? John James Audubon, I would argue, yes. I mean, who else would there be? Um, and, but um, I, here's a picture of John James Audubon. Now, John James Audubon it's an inconvenient truth, but John James Audubon hated the bald eagle. And he writes about this in uh, his ornithology biography that it was the companion, the, the text companion with um, uh, Birds of America, which is, which is only illustrations and for a specific reason that I won't go into. But he rants about the bald eagle um, in his um, ornithology bi biography. Um, and in, in two volumes he does this. In one volume it, he does it in one essay, in the next volume he does it in another one. And he also talks about shooting them, killing them. Um, he devotes a lot of ink to talking about killing eaglets. Um, and, um, and notice his, his portraits here. He sat for these. And he always wanted his, what he called, his long tom. Uh, ornithologists in his day, uh, I have a chapter in the book titled uh, Birdman, comma, or Ornithologists with Guns. Ornithologists um, before the late, now before the turn of the 20th century, typically, typically you, one of their principal instruments was the gun. Uh, they shot birds, they collected them uh, to render them uh, in, in drawings, you also had to be an artist to be a, a, a decent ornithologist in, in, in those days since their cameras didn't exist. Uh, and uh, so John James Audubon shot his fair, fair share of bald eagles and birds as well, not simply to render them for his paintings or his drawings, um, but um, he did so for sport. Um, and he talks about in his journals uh, and in other places going out and, and shooting uh, hundreds of birds in, in a day uh, with, with, with a companion. It's really, it's really unfortunate, unfortunately horrific uh, story, but it's, it's one that's part of the bald eagle's history. Now, that's not the greatest damage that John James Audubon or other ornithologists of the early 19th century and 18th century did to the bald eagle. Um, they also claimed that the bald eagle, they described it as, like Ben Franklin did, as immoral. They described it as a thief. Um, uh, they described it as, as a scavenger, which was um, an insult um, to uh, the symbol of America. And, uh, or uh, it was an insult to America because its symbol uh, was, was a scavenger. Um, he, they maintain that this bird of prey uh, uh, stole sheep, calves, piglets, and chickens from farms. Uh, and uh, yes, they will take chickens. Um, one, one rancher up in southwest Georgia I interviewed for the book described his chickens, his free range chickens, as low hanging fruits for bald eagles. <laughs> and um, they will take chickens, but they can't lift a calf. Um, a, a large bald eagle um, it could potentially lift five pounds. Um, and 
Uh, and it not even in, in most in many cases it wouldn't be able to fly off of those five pounds. You could pick it up temporarily, um, but it's not going to carry away a calf. It's not going to carry away uh, a piglet. It's not going to carry away a lamb. Uh, and but the ornithologists write about this, about how these birds are destructive, how bald eagles are destructive to uh, the American economy, uh, how they are the enemy of farmers and ranchers. Um, and, and so farmers and ranchers have this authority figure or figures um, condoning their killing of bald eagles. Uh, and they're doing it left and right through the 19th century, not just farmers and ranchers, everybody. Because who's raising chickens in those days? Everybody. People in town, they've got They've got chickens pecking around their yard, uh, either broilers or, 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 or layers. Uh, and if they saw a bald eagle, they would, even if it was, even if they didn't even catch it in action, they would shoot it. I did a search on newspapers.com, which is a tremendous archive. Thousands of local dailies and weeklies in this database. I did a search. Uh, from 1850 to 1920, and I typed in bald eagle shot. And I came up with over 140,000 results. Um, and I had a research assistant. She went through, I, obviously we couldn't go through all 140,000, but I went through a lot, she went through a lot, and we found very little repetition. Um, and so, and, but all kinds of stories of, I mean, look at these guys. Would you want to run into them <laughs> on the street? I mean, I mean, truly, have you ever, I mean, have you ever seen anybody look so crazy? <clears throat> but can you imagine what the bald eagle felt? I mean, these guys, I thought I had an intimidating stare. Um, uh, probably what the bald eagle was saying. But, you read these newspaper articles and in the 19th century on into the early 20th century, but it's, uh, things start to change after, after the turn of the century. Uh, uh, but throughout the 19th century, you read these articles and they're re reporting on the shooting of these bald eagles, uh, and there's no condemnation. What these articles are doing is they're reporting on, every, they report on the weight and the wingspan of the bird as if they're saying, John caught a 25-pound bass, a lot of large mouth bass, down at the lake yesterday. Um, and so, um, just rare, only in rare instances did I find any newspaper that condemned the shooting of the national symbol um, and of, of America's bird. Um, I mean, people are clubbing them to death. Um, they're, they're trapping them, uh, they're shooting them, anybody, it got to be so bad, we all hear about DDT, right? And had its devastation on the ball league. It was so bad that by the 1880s in the U.S., a ball eagle in the eastern states was a rare sight. Um, newspapers were saying, reporting on a shooting of a ball eagle, say, somewhere in Pennsylvania, uh, or, or New York are saying, so-and-so shot a bald eagle, we haven't seen one here in 20 years. Uh, and, um, and so it was getting so, and, and so you start off teaching your kids, you know, it's okay to shoot a bald eagle. This is what many people thought, our national bird. Uh, and, but they are shooting them left and right. And, I don't, McGuffey's Reader, McGuffey's Reader, only, the only, the McGuffey Reader was assigned in virtually every elementary school throughout the country in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, it was a reading primer for immigrants coming to America. Uh, the only book that was read more than the McGuffey's Reader was probably the Bible. And in the 1840s, a story appeared in McGuffey's Reader about a uh, eagle stealing away with a child, taking it back to its nest, 
um, putting it, dropping it in this nest beside its eaglet and amidst all this other carry-on uh, in the nest. And so the town folks rise up to go hunt down the eagle and to save the little girl. Those, the ornithologists are saying this is true. They're telling mothers, don't leave your infant lying outside in the yard alone. A bald eagle may come and take it away. Um, and this myth persists throughout the 19th, well, into the 20th century. Even past, even after World War II, people are still saying this. And of course, this is justification for shooting the bald eagle. But, so Americans in the 19th century wanted to shoot their bald eagle and have it too. They did shoot it and they did have it. They had, they had it as a symbol. It's a hugely popular symbol, uh, the bald eagle. Uh, it's, in, it's an instant, uh, it's an instant um, celebrity after its adoption for the great seal of, of the United States. Here's an Edward, Edward Savage uh, drawing of um, the liberty in the form of the goddess of youth giving support to uh, the bald eagle. Uh, liberty and the bald eagle were often united in um, in, in, in official, uh, but also popular emblems. Uh, George Washington didn't get on the coin with the bald eagle until uh, 1920, 1932, when they were both put on the quarter, uh, because he didn't want his image on coins. There were numerous proposals back in the 18th century, before America even defeats the British, to put um, George Washington in the bald eagle on uh, on money together, on coins together. Um, but he backed out and Liberty became his, his replacement. Uh, and this, of course, is, who is this? This is the goddess of Liberty who sits on top of the Capitol Dome, the U.S. Capitol Dome. Uh, and um, this, this is actually the prototype um, that uh, Thomas Crawford, uh, the sculptor, created. Uh, and it was not very popular. Um, this is the bald eagle on the, on the helmet or the head of, of Liberty. And look at it. Nobody can figure out what the heck Crawford was doing. It's a disembodied bald eagle. You know, it's a head and it's feathers, crazy feathers coming out from his head that don't belong there. And Crawford died before anybody could ask him, what, are you, what, were, what were you thinking of? Um, and but that's what we, we have today. Um, but uh, in here, I mean, it's it's the most popular animal mascot for sports teams in the United States. The eagle is. Um, and right away in the 19th century, with the rise of American organized American sports, uh, the eagle becomes very popular. This is actually a marching band. It's an uh, image I'm including in the book. I just I just love these guys. Uh, sitting there with their eagle. Aren't those great jerseys? Um, and of course, this is this is an orange or citrus crate. Uh, there were all sorts of um, uh, bald eagle images on citrus crates uh, back in the 19th and the early 20th century uh, when creating these labels was a, was a real art. Uh, that's, of course, there were numerous cigar companies that used eagles uh, as their uh, as their emblem or, or their mascot. Then there's the AMC Eagle automobile. That was in production for eight or nine years. Um, not a very good car, unfortunately. It didn't live up to its name by any means. Um, and this is, of course, a familiar you know, black leather vest of Harley riders, um, the, bald, the bald eagle. The bald eagle actually isn't Harley Davidson's symbol. It's a symbol of HAR, uh, Harley Owners Group. Um, and they adopted the bald eagle, I think of 1981, I think HAR, uh, Harley, Owner, Harley Owners Group was, was organized. And uh, so you see these in, in, in various uh, designs quite often on the back of motorcycles. And this is actually a friend of mine, and, uh, and this is his Harley. Or 
what he calls his Harley. It's a 1982, does anybody know what this is? 1982, Honda what? Yeah, yeah, uh, but, but this is called um, the uh, Urban Express Deluxe. And there's nothing express about this 20 mile an hour moped, and certainly nothing deluxe, except maybe the, uh, the milk basket on the back. I, I just had to share that. Um, now, even while um, Americans were um, killing bald eagles, but also celebrating them, um, um, native peoples, native cultures, long before uh, Europeans came to America, embrace the bald eagle as a spirit bird. Of course, there are countless native cultures. We can't lump them uh, into uh, one in undifferentiated whole. But uh, many across the continent, uh, from uh, east coast to west coast, from north to south, native groups embraced the bald eagle as a spirit bird, a messenger bird, a bird that communicated uh, with, with the higher powers. And, uh, and, to ans uh, and to ancestors as, as well. Uh, feathers, just birds generally, and feathers uh, were um, important symbols, religious symbols for uh, native, native groups as well. You could go into a village and you would see feathers. I mean, as I write in the book, these, many of these villages were just uh, fluttering with feathers. They were used everywhere. Uh, Kachina dolls, of course, um, uh, dream catchers, coup sticks that these, um, uh, the, these three have. Uh, so more than just, you know, the Hollywood um, uh, Indian headdress. Uh, extremely important, used in all sorts of rituals. And, um, and so to get the feathers, Native peoples either killed bald eagles, the, the, the tail feathers were most popular, uh, killed bald eagles, uh, or they would catch them as eaglets and raise them as the Zuni did. I love this photograph. Uh, and the Zuni would go out and they would take one bald eagle from a nest, as long as the nest had at least two eaglets, um, and take one eaglet from a nest, take it back uh, to Pueblo, and raise it in uh, an eagle stockade, such as this one here. And, and they would keep in mind, that's, that's, a, that's a juvenile uh, bald eagle uh, on top of that stockade. And when they would molt, they, they would collect the feathers. Uh, and uh, why one report of, of someone going into the, um, uh, into the Zuni Pueblo in, around this time, reporting it, uh, he saw 75 eagle stockades. Um, but most Native peoples who valued eagle feathers had a designated eagle catcher or eagle hunter uh, who would go out, such as uh, the, uh, this uh, Lakota eagle catcher. Uh, the Cherokee over here on the East Coast had designated eagle hunters. And they would go out and they had various means, ways of the land of the um uh, Pennsylvania and Delaware and, and, and New York, uh, um, they would go out and they had various means of, of capturing and, and killing the bald eagles um, and that I don't need to go into here. Uh, and this is a, a, a really, I think, dramatic, obviously posed um, a photograph of, a, of an eagle catcher, but, I, but also I think it, it, tells, it tells the story. Now, even though Native peoples are going out and killing bald eagles, they don't by, come anywhere close to bringing to the brink of extinction like um, um, Americans, white Americans did, uh, or non-Native Americans did. And, uh, and, and so, and because this was happening, many people, even though there were many people who, if not most, were insensitive to the, the plight of the living bald eagle, by the turn of the century, uh, there's a new era that comes along for the bald eagle. People are concerned about it. Uh, they said, they're saying, look, we've, we've nearly lost the bison. We've lost, you know, 1914, we lose the passenger pigeon. Four years later, we lose the, the Carolina parakeet. Um, and, uh, and people are saying, we can't do this 
you know, what would America look like if it killed off this national symbol? And, uh, and these are three important people in, among many, in the campaign to try to save the bald eagle in the early 20th century. Um, Francis Hare, anybody here from Ohio? Oh, great. Francis Hare um, was, was an ornithologist who taught a case western uh, in the 1920s began, this, this is a guy, he, he represents a new ornithology. He's an ornithologist without guns. Of course, they have, cam they have camera technology by, by his, his day uh, at the turn of the century, early 20th century. And he says, we can learn much more about birds with the camera than we can with the gun. And more and more ornithologists were coming on and board with that uh, idea. Uh, and he was one of the first people to study what he called the home life of birds. Um, using photography. In the 1920s, up on Lake Erie in Ohio, Vermilion, he started studying um, bald eagles, one particular um, bald eagle couple, uh, and, uh, and for, for many years. Uh, and he would build these tall towers next to their, their Erie or their nest so he could photograph them. Um, and he wrote this spectacular book that came out in 1931, titled American Eagle, about his research. And with some really great photographs. Here's one of the photographs. And this is called the Great Erie. This is, look how big this nest is. That was nicknamed the Great Erie. The people of Vermillion, this nest was 35 years old before it went down in a storm. Uh, and the people of Vermillion, Ohio said, wouldn't let anybody harm these eagles. Uh, and Herrick studied them, and uh, there's, you can see there's a plowed field behind them. Um, and he's the guy who really taught us about, you know, the domestic life of, of bald eagles. And when this nest came down in a storm, he estimated, well, he measured it. It was, uh, it was eight feet across, 12 feet deep. And he estimated it would weigh probably one and a half tons. Uh, and, or one and a half tons. Um, pretty, pretty spectacular. Well, it, comes to, it came down, what happened? They immediately started building another one. Uh, and then someone shot one of the maids. And the female immediately went out, or shot the maid, the, the male. The female immediately went out and got a new male. And uh, can you, before the, uh, before the, actually before the nest came down, can you imagine what that male was thinking when she brought him back and showed him, look what I've got for you. And this guy's thinking, oh my God, I really, you know, I got a sugar mama here. <laughs> look at this, I got a castle. Um, and uh, uh, it, was, it was really an eagle to him. Uh, the, and so Francis Herrick really lightened the American public with his writings about the bald eagle. But he also became an activist. Uh, he said, we gotta stop this. We gotta stop shooting the bald eagle. Uh, along with uh, Willard Van Name over here on the, on the far, far right, who was an ornithologist at the, at the, the, the American Natural Museum of History in, in New York. And he would write these pamphlets condemning uh, the shooting of the bald eagle. He also attacked the Audubon Society because the Audubon Society wasn't stepping up. The Audubon Society in those days um, was cozy with the ammunition companies. And Audubon Society was more concerned about saving game birds than anything else and condoned the shooting of birds of prey because they were seen as destructive to the American economy and to the farmer. And Willard Van Ames writing these pamphlets. Uh, and and the, the, the Museum of Natural History, American Museum of Natural History, has a close relationship with Audubon, and they shut him up. They put a gag order on him, so you can't do this anymore. So he gets together with Rosalie Edge, who lives in New York City, is a birder, uh, and, um, the, and she knows about the destruction of bald eagles and other birds of prey, and she's horrified about this. Who, who's from Pennsylvania? Hawk Mountain, you've heard Hawk Mountain? She's the founder of Hawk Mountain. Hawk Mountain, which is, which is a, um, on a, a, 
major migration route of, 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 of birds of prey. It's a fabulous place to visit if you're ever up there in the fall to see birds, uh, my, uh, birds of prey migrating south. So, um, so, the, so the three of them work together, and what's happening at the same time is in Alaska, Alaska has a bounty on bald eagles that, uh, that was implemented in 1970, 17, uh, and bald eagles are big, big to protect the salmon industry. They're taking too many salmon. You know, the salmon that they're taking are which salmon? The ones that are about to die, that aren't good for the market. Because they go for the easy pickings, right? Bald eagles are smart. Uh, and it's all about conserving energy in wildlife, right? And bald eagles know, let's get these salmon that are about to die. Um, but the fishermen are saying, we, gotta, we, we need to destroy these. And so the territory legislature implements this, uh, this bounty. Uh, and so they're hard. They're, try, they're trying to fight this bounty. Audubon doesn't object to the bounty. Um, and so they push, along with others, for Congress to adopt the Bald Eagle Protection Act. Um, and in 1930, Congress considers a bill to, to provide protection to the Bald Eagle. It fails uh, in the House, passes in the Senate. Uh, in 1935, it was introduced again, fails in the House, uh, and uh, passes in the Senate. What Audubon is doing at, and Audubon is invited to T. Gilbert Pearson, who's from Florida, <clears throat> who's the director of Audubon, is invited to testify at these hearings. And Pearson, the director, the head guy of Audubon, along, his, along with his first vice president, Theodore Palmer, are testifying that the bald eagle is a non-migratory bird. Everybody else, hair, edge, Band name, all these others know indeed it's a migratory bird. Why does that make a difference? Because the Migratory Bird Treaty Act would protect it, right? Um, and um, but in Congress, and in fact, Theodore Palmer testifies during one of the hearings and says, "Look, this is not a migratory bird. If you put federal protection on it, then you're interfering with states' rights." And Congress doesn't want to interfere with states' rights. So twice the bill, the bill failed. Finally, in 1940, things are really getting desperate for the bald eagle. Um, newspapers are coming around and, and condemning the killing of bald eagles. Uh, they're saying we need to protect our national quote unquote bird. We need to protect this national symbol. We're on the verge of entering war in Europe. We cannot destroy the, the fascist and the bald eagle too. We've got to save the bald eagle. So the argument that wins the day in 1940 for the Bald Eagle Protection Act is that we got we need to preserve the living model of this national symbol. Uh, and with the with and Theodore Roosevelt uh, was uh, Franklin Roosevelt, excuse me, was quite happy to sign. He was a big fan of birds, a uh, big birder, uh, conservationist. He doesn't get enough credit for his, his conservation. Uh, policies um, uh, gladly signed. In fact, endorsed the legislation before he signed it. Um, and with that, the bald eagle became the only single species with federal protection. It's the first. Here, this hated living species of the 19th century, um, it, it gets this unprecedented protection by 1940. And he, um, <clears throat> here's the act, I don't want to read it. Bald eagle is no longer a mere bird of biological interest, but a symbol of the American, American ideals of freedom. Um, notice the, the Alaska exemption. Alaska was exemption, exempted. Alaska continued its bounty from 1917 to 1952, ended up paying bounties on 128,000 bald eagles during that. $500 imprisonment, six months in jail, or both. Except for those guys we saw in the earlier picture. So, a new era. The bald eagle with this protection is starting to make a comeback. Here's a really great guy. You can barely see him. Charles Burley. Anybody heard of him? Anybody here from Winnipeg? 
Charles Burley was a Winnipeg banker who retired to Tampa in 1950, when he was in 1935, when he was 59, almost 60. He was a burner, but he'd never done what he did here for 20 years. He'd climb nest trees, get in the nest with the eaglets and ban them. Nobody was doing that when he started doing that in the 1930s. And uh, Charles Broly's doing that until he's 79 years old. He's climbing these damn longleaf pines and loblollies. Uh, and, he, and he devises his own way to do it with two ladders, two rope ladders. Um, and um, he ended up banning some 1,200 eagles and estimated he climbed 1,100 trees. Um, and he would continue doing it, but he died in 79 of a heart attack up, um, uh, uh, when he was at his summer home in, in, uh, in Canada. And what Broly did for us was he, he gave us some sense of how bald eagles migrate, where they migrate to. Um, and, um, and so here is a crude migration map that I've made up. Look at these crazy Florida birds. They're going all the way up to Canada all along the, the East Coast. I talked to some ornithologists up in Massachusetts and they, they told me uh, in the 80s and 90s, and I'm sure today too, they were finding bald eagles from Florida uh, along the coast of Massachusetts that were starving to death. Uh, and, um, and they lost quite a few of them that they, they tried, to, tried to save. But these guys are going, they, they are, they and Canadian bald eagles appear to be, as far as we know, the, the longest migrant. We're still, science is still learning a lot about the bald eagle. Um, but you can see where, so the northern bald eagles tend to come south or toward the middle of the country, and the southern ones tend to go uh, after nesting season toward the middle of, of, of the country. Bald eagles can take the cold. The northern bald eagle, so-called northern bald eagle, can take the cold. Um, because they're heavier, heavier birds. As long as they can get food, they migrate where they can get food. But then DDT comes along. We all know that story. It's devastating for the bald eagles uh, across the country, except for Alaska, because Alaska doesn't have agriculture like other places. Uh, and and let me just give you so. All the New England states by the 1960s, 1970s, uh, except for Maine, had, were without a single nesting pair. Uh, all the southern states, except for Florida and South Carolina and Louisiana, were without nesting pairs. Uh, and, and it's the same across the country. Pennsylvania, none. Uh, Ohio, none. Uh, Indiana, not since 1879, I think it was. Um, and, but we, we brought them back to life. You, how many of you guys know this? This is, of course, Andy Warhol's bald eagle from his Endangered Species Collection. We think of the Endangered Species Act as saving the bald eagle. What saved the bald eagle, yes, it was important, but the, the bald eagle did more for the Endangered Species Act uh, by being his poster child uh, than what it did for it. The Bald Eagle Protection Act, but also the 1972 Clean Water Act. If we had not cleaned up the bays and the bayous around the country, particularly in, in, in places like Florida and the Chesapeake and up along the northeast coast, um, and, and brought those bays and bayous back to life, the bald eagle would not have come back to life. And to bring them, to restore the populations um, um, throughout the country, they established these hacking programs. They would take eaglets from healthy states, from such as northern uh, Midwestern states, Alaska and Canada, I'm, I'm racking up here soon, and, uh, and take them to places like Massachusetts that had no birds, uh, no nesting eagles, uh, raise them from four weeks to 12 weeks in these hack towers, they're called, so they would imprint on that environment, uh, release them at 12 weeks, and because they imprinted on the environment, the hope was that they would come back and nest there and reestablish nesting populations in those states. And it happened, it worked. It was a huge success. It started, here's a group of heroes in, in Massachusetts who were, ran the hacking program there. Uh, here's a Florida hero, Doris Magger, who in 1979 lived a week up in the Eagle's Nest in, in Central Florida, bringing attention to the plight of the eagle. And, and when she was 60 years old, she biked across the United States 
from California to Florida to bring attention to the plight of the eagle, giving lectures at Kmart stores because Kmart sponsored her. She's still, she's 94 years old, she's still giving lectures in schools. Well, of course, during COVID, she's not. And the, who are these guys? They're yours. These are... Ozzy, I don't know if that's Ozzy and Harriet or Ozzy or Harriet in M15, but it's these are from your Eagle Cam. Uh, so one more thing I'll say, and then I'll stop. The Eagle population is doing tremendous today. Um, thanks to Eagle Cams, thanks to Hacking Program, thanks to Clean Water, thanks because we also care and love the bald eagle. Uh, it was down to uh, under 500 nesting pairs in the lower 48 in 1963. Uh, and today, across North America, Canada, uh, the lower 48 in Alaska, there are probably 300,000 bald eagles, which is spectacular. Uh, and probably 15 to 20,000 nesting pairs in, in the lower 48. So do we have, have time for questions? One question. Yeah. One question. Oh, one sorry. Question. Sorry, I went on. Sorry. All right, you raise your hand first. What do you have to ask? Uh, we have a pair of eagles on our property in Michigan, and the University of Maryland uh, does studies on the eagles. I think since 1962, and they send uh, a team out across Michigan and they study 80 pairs of eagles. Yeah. And they uh, they go up the tree and they weigh the babies. And, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, uh, we, the states are no longer keeping a, a population census on eagles since it was delisted in 2007. Um, and they're supposed to do one every 20 years. But some of the states and some of the universities uh, do, in fact, keep uh, track of eagle populations. And they're doing healthy, doing doing quite well. And as I said, research continues. There's a lot about the bald eagle we don't know. No more, no more time. Did I go too long? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you to Jeff Davis. As we said, he does have both of his books out front if you're interested in purchasing them. But, you know, thank goodness for all the people throughout history. It does, and it continues even today. You have to keep verbal and vocal and getting the word out. The, the cams are a fabulous way to do that. But it's, it's, it's presentations by the 95-year-old woman you were talking about and authors like Jack to care about wildlife and our wild spaces and clean water. It's a constant challenge that always needs to be brought up to the conversations. And unfortunately, much of it is political, but it takes all of us to be heard. And so please be involved, be engaged, attend things like this, continue to to do that, but we appreciate everybody caring, and uh, thank you for being with us. The bald eagle is an amazing species, and I cannot wait for your book to come out. So thank you, Jack. Yes, one more thing. I'm, I'm happy to personalize any, all the books are signed, but if you want one personalized, I'm happy to do that. 